baptism is. Baptism is done for the forgiveness of sins, Acts 2.38. Baptism is done to save us, 1 Peter 3.21, Acts 2.40, Mark 16.16. 16. Baptism is done to wash away our sins, Acts 22.16. Baptism is done to be reborn to new life, John 3.5, Romans 6, 3 through 6. Baptism is done to clothe ourselves with Christ, Galatians 3, 26 and 27. Trust in the Lord with all your hearts, and lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your path. the other day and uh so so tell me what's how's life been treating you uh it's been good just busy and you know getting into the mold of marriage yeah <laughs> yeah i always laugh when people say so how's marriage like like now oh it's fine as if somebody goes it's terrible you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh that's cool yeah it was i think it was more the coincidence we ran into each other because i hadn't seen you in a while and and uh i'd heard you got married and and uh, so, it's, you know, you know me, the church dude. I'm always, I'm always looking to reconnect with people, and and uh, for me, it was more than coincidence. So, so, uh, any thoughts on 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 any of that? Uh, just, you know, I, I, I grew up in church, and I believe in everything. I just, you know, want to go a little. More. Yeah, the feeling of kind of a. It's got to be something more. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be something. You know, there's a. I think that's. I think that's an important part of this issue is that you're looking for something that seems to be missing. All right, cool. There's your creamer and your splenda. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. Oh, Oh, thank you. Well, you know, I, I was there too. I know, uh, I know exactly that feeling of, of believing there's something else there. You know, what's life? What does life have to do uh, beyond just getting up, going to work, fighting traffic? You know, you guys in the bay over here, I mean, traffic's a deal. So you're like, it's got to be more to life than this. Um, and then getting married, and, and then you'll see it even more when you have children. You'll begin to think about, you know, really, is life just about getting a paycheck, going home, spending it on vacation or on bills, and then check out at 70 or 80 or 90, you know, if you live a long time? So is there, is there, there's got to be more to life than that, right? And then, and then is, I like cream. I like a little coffee with my cream. Yeah, I see that. Um, so um, for me, that was what began my journey. And so when we were talking the other day and, and we kind of discussed the possibility of would you be interested in, in learning a little bit more, I, I spent some time in prayer. And so uh, I think this is going to be a, a good time together. And I think there's some, some opportunities 
in our meeting today for you to, I know you said you went to church, and I know we've talked about that in the past, but maybe some, uh, man, that's good coffee. Bosco coffee is awesome. Yeah, the roast yeah. is great. The roast is great, yeah. Cool. Uh, so, what I like to do is, if we're going to do this, just have a little word of prayer, because it's not just us here. God's with us. And uh, so let's pray. God, I ask that uh, you would touch my friend today and touch me. Come into this uh, coffee shop today and let the Word of God speak life to us and impart wisdom and knowledge and understanding that we would grow in grace and come to know you better and, and reveal yourself to my friend today. I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, what I like to do is I just kind of like to share the Word of God together because we're the way I like to think of it is is uh, I'm just a beggar that found some bread. You know, I'm, I'm no better than you. I'm just somebody that just found some stuff and I want to share it. And so uh, what I thought we'd do is we'd kind of go through some scriptures today and uh, kind of show you what shaped, you know, the Christian that I became. You know, I want it to be not about what my grandma said or my aunt said or my, even my parents. I want, I want to know what does the Bible say. And, and you told me the other day that you believe the Word of God is the Word of God. So... This book's pretty important for me, and so I'll show you kind of the journey that I went through in just a few minutes here. Uh, kind of for me is, is some scriptures meant uh, some pretty important thoughts came to me as I was reading the Word of God. And in 1 Peter 2.10, it said, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if you do these things, you will never fail. So he said that I'm supposed to give diligence to make sure my calling or my salvation is where it should be. So for me, it was a serious matter. Another, another place the Bible said, Philippians uh, 2 and 12, is that we're to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. He wasn't saying go figure out your own way. But what he was saying is that I have a personal responsibility to work out my own. In other words... I can't work out your salvation, and your mom and dad couldn't work out yours, or the preacher couldn't for me, my mom and dad. I had to do it myself, and I had to take diligence to, to do that. So salvation and our relationship with God is our personal responsibility, and there's a whole lot of scriptures in the Bible that point to that, and there's a, there's a pretty sobering scripture in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 14 that says, Narrow is the way. Uh, and it talks about a path of destruction being wide. And so in other words, there's a lot of people on this wide road that leads to destruction, but the way of salvation is a narrow one, and few there be that find it. So I've got to diligently work this out. I've got to treat it soberly. I've got to treat it, you know, it's serious. It's fear and trembling. And if there's a wide path with a lot of people on it leading to destruction, that means I can't just follow what the group's doing. I've got to personally take responsibility. And for me, that's where the journey began is kind of like you. You were, you were feeling, you told me you were feeling this, uh, there's something more. It's because you're hungering and thirsting after righteousness. And the Bible teaches us that they that hunger and thirst after righteousness will be filled. And so I, I think that's kind of where we are today. And does that make sense, what, I, what I'm showing you there? Yeah. So, what I like to do is, when I'm, when I'm sharing the Word of God, is I like to go back to a very important figure whose name was Peter. You know, you know the Apostle Peter. Okay? You know, some people think he was the first pope. He, he plays a pretty significant role in religion. And uh, so, for me, I like to go to why is that? Where did that come from? And in Matthew chapter 16, uh, you can turn there, Matthew 16, the Bible says uh, here... There, Jesus was talking to his disciples, and he, he asked them, he said, who do, who do men say that I am? They start saying, well, you're John the Baptist, you're Elias, on and on, they give these lists. And then he looks at them, okay, and here's the idea that we were just talking about, is that, remember, it's, it's not about what other people think, it's you've got to work out your own salvation. And he literally, he asked them, he said, who do you say? In other words, not what everybody else says, now that you've told me that. He said, I want to know... Uh, have you noticed there's a lot of people listening to our conversation in this coffee shop right now? No, so don't, don't look now if there's a lot of people listening. So he asked them, whom do you say that I am? And that was the moment where the, 
the Apostle Peter says, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, said Peter, you're, you're blessed because flesh and blood didn't, didn't reveal this to you, but my Father which is in heaven. So this revelation comes to Peter, and then in that conversation, and this is real important that we get this, is that he tells Peter, he says, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it against it but he tells Peter he says I give you the keys to the kingdom what do keys do they unlock stuff right stuff that's locked up that you need a key for so Jesus gives to Peter a key to unlock the doors to the kingdom evidently indicating that unless you have that key you can't get it open I mean, this is a logical thing. You know, you don't have to be you don't have to be a theologian. It's just pretty important. So what that means for me is is in our Bible study today, Peter plays a pretty important role. Okay? So what I want to do is I want to take you through, I call it the and this will make sense at the end, I call it the three, two, one step. Okay? And this is kind of how I do the Bible study, and I think it'll make sense. And so the way I the way I break it down is is three, two, one. Okay, so go uh, turn in your Bible. I'll let you read these. Turn in your Bible to Mark, Matthew, Mark, uh, second gospel, Mark 16 and verse 16, and uh, read that. He that believeth and is baptized shall, shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Okay, I want you to notice this, okay? Now, if you had, see how my Bible, is, I have read, letter, you, you stole that from a hotel, didn't you? That's a Gideon Bible. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh. <laughs> I really did. <laughs> okay, so, so the first thing we're going to do is repent. So, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> so in, in Mark 16 and 16, these are the words of Jesus. Okay, and I want you to notice something pretty cool here. He that believeth, okay, that's number one, and is baptized, number two. Okay, don't miss the conjunction, and, okay, is that there is belief and there is baptism. And without belief and baptism, if you don't do that, he said, you're going to be damned. Okay, judgment's going to come, right? Okay. So there's, this is important, there's belief and baptism, okay? To be free from that damnation, it requires two things, belief and baptism, okay? Now, let's go to John chapter 7, John 7 and 38. So, uh, John 7, 37, start there, let's read there. John 7, 37, read there. In the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. Okay, so, come to me, but who, remember, who's saying this here? Jesus. Okay, Jesus is saying this, okay? Next verse. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay, so here's belief again. Jesus is saying this, there's belief. And then he says, there's going to be something that's coming out of him. All right? Okay. Read that next verse. But this spake he unto the Spirit. Of the Spirit. Right? Of the Spirit. Yep. Which they that believe on him should receive, for the Holy Ghost was not yet given. Okay. See how, see how this is building? So the first scripture in Matthew 16, 16, said that belief and baptism were required to hold off damnation, right? Okay, so now Jesus stands up at that great feast and says, you need to come believe on me. And he says, and if you do that, there's going to be something that comes out of you, like, like a river. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. There's, an al there's something alive that's flowing, right? And then, this is pretty cool, because the Bible gives a commentary. It explains what he's talking about. He, he doesn't just leave it in this mystical, you know, a river in your belly. That sounds like indigestion or something. But, but it's explaining 
there's something going on spiritually like a river. There's a flowing inside of you. And then the Bible explains that this spake he of the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, which every one that, what? What does it say? That believeth, right? That believeth, yes. Okay, so everyone that believes like the Scripture, in other words, there's a particular way that you're supposed to believe. Okay, so everyone that believes like the Scripture says, there's going to be this something, the Spirit, there's this spiritual encounter, and... Everyone that believes, this is Jesus that says that, that's going to happen, okay? So we've got belief, we've got baptism, we've got Jesus saying that, we've got this spiritual encounter, and then he says it's not yet given. So evidently, what he's talking to was, was going to come afterward. It hadn't happened when he tells them that, right? Okay, so now let's turn over uh, to John, okay, or uh, to Luke. Let's go to Luke uh, 24. 47. Okay, what does that say? And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. Okay, so who's saying this? this Jesus is saying this, right? So that, that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in the name of Jesus. Okay, it just said that. You read that. Okay, but I want you to notice something that's pretty cool. What? Where did he say that was going to happen? Beginning at Jerusalem. Okay, so Jerusalem must have a significance. Okay, so what happens is these are three pretty important scriptures. Okay, so we've got, we've got Mark 16, 16. We've got John... Uh, 7, 37, 38, 39, and now we've got, we've got John, uh, or Luke, 24, 47, okay? And in all three of these passages, who was speaking? Jesus. Jesus was speaking, okay? It's pretty important. And so from that, we've got, we've got repentance, we've got belief, we've got baptism, we've got the name, and we've got a spirit encounter, and we've got a place, Jerusalem, Okay? So, Jesus is there. So now let's go to the second part of this. Let's go to Acts chapter 1, which is that Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts will be the next one. So let's go to chapter 1. And so, uh, I want you to know something. Who did he give the keys to the kingdom to? Peter. To Peter, okay? So, look, uh, read, read verses 1 through 4 right there in uh, Acts chapter 1. The former treatise have I made, O oh, Theophilus. Thank you. Yeah. Of all that Jesus. You know where that name came from? No, where did it come from? It came from a hospital. A lady had a baby. The doctor picked it up. He said, "You need to call this baby Theophilus." And the lady said, "Why?" He said, "Because it's Theophilus looking thing I've ever seen." <laughs> not, not real. I'm just kidding, dude. That wasn't in the that wasn't in the script. Right? Okay. okay. All right. That's not in there, I promise. Okay. So what, what did what did Luke say? What, what did he say that this that this was this treatise or letter was about? Of all that Jesus began both to do and teach. Okay, so that's pretty important. I wanted you to notice that. Is that what, what Jesus did in those first four gospels and those scriptures we read? Basically what he's saying is he said, I'm writing this book now to continue all that he began to do and teach. Okay, so uh, now in the book of Acts, look at verse number 9 of chapter 1. Read that if you don't mind. And when he had began, when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, he was taken up and a cloud received him out of their sight. Okay, so this is the moment that Jesus ascends into the heavens, okay? He tells them in this moment that he wants them to go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, okay? He's told them that he's going to send the Comforter back in his name and all this. So he tells them, before he ascends up into heaven, he says, go to Jerusalem, which is where he told them there's that city again. Now look at verse number 12. Read verse number 12. Then returned they unto Jerusalem from the mount called 
Alvet. Alvet, yeah. Yeah. Which is from Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey. Okay. So they obey. He says, go to Jerusalem. They go to Jerusalem. Okay. Which is where he said in Luke 24, 47 that this was going to be a significant place. So they go back. Okay. Now go to chapter 2 and read verses 1 through 4. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, so here's pretty cool. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Okay, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Okay, think back to what he said. Out of your belly shall flow rivers of living water. Okay, this spake ye of the Spirit. So this is what happened. Okay, now what happens is a multitude gathers and they want to hear everything that's going on and uh, look at uh, look at verse number, let me see here. Look, uh, look at verse number 12, read 12 and 13, and look what happens. And they were all amazed, and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? Others mocking said, These men are full of new wine. Okay, so, this crowd here is this big buzz. That, I mean, these people are talking in heavenly languages, and twelve tongues like as a fire sits upon. This is like a, a crazy, one of those crazy Pentecostal Holy Roller services, okay? And the word gets out. So people come to watch and see what happens. And so they start, they got questions. What, what does this mean? What is this? Now look at verse number 14. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice. Okay, and so what I want you to notice is, who's the guy that starts talking? Peter. Peter. The guy with the keys. Okay, so he starts talking. The reason he's the one that talks is because he's the guy that's got the key. And what, boss, what's about to happen is he's going to take that key and unlock the door for people to enter into the kingdom. So when he stands up, he begins to preach. And he begins to preach a message to them. And it's a pretty powerful message. What he preaches is, you know that guy you just crucified? Okay, these are Jews, okay? They had been waiting on Messiah. They, they had looked for the day of the Lord where he would come, you know, overthrow the Roman government, overthrow man-made, and set up his heavenly people on earth, you know, this, that we're the chosen people. So they were waiting. They knew that one day Messiah would come. So that's who they've been waiting on. And now Peter stands up and tells them, guys, do you realize that the guy you just crucified is Messiah? The one that's going to judge the earth and there's going to be fire and smoke. Really, he preaches a message of judgment. Okay? That you just kill the guy that's going to judge the world. You just kill the guy that's going to, the day of the Lord. Okay? He talks about the last. They knew what all that meant. Well, what happens as he's preaching, they get under conviction. Look at verse number 37. Look at what verse number 37 of chapter 2 says. Now when they heard this, they heard his sermon, okay? They were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? So, judgment, this is where a lot of people miss this. This was not like a cool little Sunday school lecture. He was preaching a message of conviction that unless you get right, that one you just crucified is the one that's going to come judge the earth. He's the one that when you look for the day of the Lord, and you killed him. Well, no wonder. They, they were under condemnation. And their question was not, how do we get more power? That wasn't what they were asking. Why do you need conviction for that? Why would they be convicted to want more power? Their hearts were convicted. They realized, oh my, we just killed Messiah. We just crucified the one that's going to judge the heavens and the earth. And so, as a result, their hearts convicted them. And they look at Peter, the guy with the keys, and they say, what do we do? In other words, how do we save ourselves? How do we fix this? How do we, how do we fix ourselves 
from this judgment that's going to come on us. Now look at what happens in verse number 38. Read verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay. This is so cool. Is that I go to what's called a Pentecostal church. A Pentecostal church gets its name because we are people that follow what happened on the day of Pentecost, like was in that, that verse you read. It was a Jewish feast day. And what happened was that spirit encounter happened. But now look at how all of this comes together. Do you remember what town they're in? Jerusalem. They're in Jerusalem. Who's the guy preaching to them? What did Peter have from Jesus? Okay, and so in this one verse, all of those scriptures that we read in the Gospels, and Luke said, I'm going to continue what Jesus began to do and teach. What Jesus had taught is all wrapped up now in this verse, because watch this. Then Peter, you read it, then Peter said unto them, repent, remember he said repentance is going to be preached. And be baptized, there's baptism, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, because remission is going to be preached in my name, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit. Okay? And what they had received was this Spirit encounter. There was this flowing out. It flowed out into the streets. People heard about it and they came. Where are they at? They're in Jerusalem. So it's pretty incredible that all of this stuff comes together in this one passage. And so the answer to their question was, what do we do? He says, you repent of your sins. You be baptized in the name of Jesus for the remission of those sins. And you're going to receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, just like Jesus said, all that he began to do and teach. Out of your belly is going to flow. This spake he of the Spirit, the Spirit encounter. This is literally what happened. And so, by that, now I want to close this because it's pretty. It, it, it's not a big deal. I mean, it's not this. You don't have to have a, a degree. You don't have to read every page in here. It's, it's pretty simple. All this is coming together right here. And I want to show you one more scripture. Turn in your Bible to Hebrews chapter two and verse three. And this is kind of the journey that I took to find. Uh, the answers to what I was seeking. Hebrews, right there. Hebrews chapter 2, okay? And look at verse number 3. How shall we escape okay. if we neglect so great salvation? Okay, think about what he just said. How shall we escape? What are we trying to escape? We're trying to escape judgment, right? Remember, they were convicted, okay? How shall we escape if we neglect, neglect what? Judgment. So great a salvation if we neglect the salvation. Okay, how are we going to escape it if we neglect it? So other, in other words, we've got to grab hold of, but read on. What else did he say there? Which at, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. Did you get that? Who said all that? Jesus. So the salvation that can be neglected, that we don't want to neglect, we want to hold on to salvation, is the words that he began. Okay? That's what happened. While he was on earth, he was preaching to them and telling them, go to Jerusalem. You're going to receive an encounter. I'm going to send the promise of the Father. I'm not going to leave you. I'm going to, I'm going to send a comforter. And we could go through a lot of scriptures. But the point I'm trying to make is, that he was teaching them and teaching the people following him. And when you get to Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2, it all comes together. What Peter taught was the very same thing that Jesus taught. There's going to be a lot of people that tell you, well, I'm only going to listen to Jesus. I'm not going to listen to Peter. Well, that's cool. <laughs> but they taught the same thing. And the writer to the Hebrews said, we, we can't be saved if we neglect what Jesus began to teach. And those that heard him. Well, who heard him? Peter heard him. He was, Peter didn't get up and do something different. 
He was teaching the very same things that Jesus taught. And when he gave him that spiritual key, he was basically saying, Peter, take this key and unlock the door so people can get into the kingdom. So for me, Boston, that's how, as I begin to study the Word of God, looking for how do I, you know, I believe, I believe God, but if I believe God, something's supposed to happen to me if I believe like the Scripture says, I'm supposed to have some kind of encounter that out of my belly, you know, and honestly just believing in Jesus, I hadn't really felt any of that. I hadn't had any river flowing stuff, okay? But what happened is when I went to a Pentecostal church, I repented of my sins. I was baptized in Jesus' name. And exactly what happened in Acts chapter 2 happened to me. It's the greatest thing that ever happened. I still remember it happened when it happened to me. And it radically changed my life. And my advice to you is that you begin to seek in your life what I've showed you because it's real. And I got a feeling that several more people in this coffee shop, it happened to. They're acting like they're just kind of observing, but it happened to them too. And it can happen for you. Okay? So uh, why don't we, before we go, I know I, I got to get to work here a little bit, but I'm glad we took time on the lunch break to do this. But uh, uh, can I pray with you that, that God will help lead you and guide you? God, I pray that the words of your book, of your your scripture would take root in my life and in his life. And God, you brought us together. You brought our paths together again. And I pray that it would come alive and it would be like that flowing river of life that would come into his spirit. I pray that you would baptize him with revelation of truth and fill him with that comforter, fill him with that spirit that is Christ in him, the hope of glory. I ask it in your wonderful name. Amen. Bro, it was good to see you. All right. Tell your wife I look forward to meeting her. All right. God bless. Well, did y'all enjoy that? Well, what we did today is besides just taking another trip down memory lane of those scriptures. How many love those scriptures? Amen. Amen. How many remember any of those scriptures when you came to know the Lord? The point of uh, our lesson besides tricking my dad into providing free coffee for us tonight (laughs) was one of the things that I think limits the apostolic church is that too many of us are afraid we're not qualified to teach a Bible study. Okay, and uh, really Bible study to someone that doesn't know God is not near as hard as it seems. Okay, now some of you were thinking, man, I don't know if I could do what you just did. It's really not that hard. I'm going to give you a trick. How many would like to have a trick to remember and just be able to flow, be instant in season, out of season? Okay. Now, some of you are like world-class Bible study teachers, uh, but most of us aren't, okay? So we have to, to kind of get a strategy or plan. And if you're a young person, I want to help you become bold in your faith, okay? You don't have to wait till you're 40 to be a Bible study teacher, okay? You can be an effective Bible study teacher. And what I just walked you through is a pretty simple process, and I want to unpack it for you. Look at your neighbor say, he's going to unpack it for us. Okay, so here is my strategy. Okay, when I'm going to, uh, obviously I didn't have a big Bible study chart and I may not, most of the time, you're not going to get a 10 week Bible study. You may with people you have ongoing relationship. Most of the time, you're going to get one shot. Okay, I love those 10 week ones. I I used to go with my mom and dad. I still remember the, the family my mom and dad won to the Lord. My mom and dad were soul winners from way back. And Ori and Winnie Mitchell. I love going because Winnie always had a cake when we got there. That was like, that's what I remember. I don't remember anything my dad taught, but I remember the cake that Winnie Mitchell would, would, would serve. So, uh, uh, so you have a lot of cool moments when you're teaching those extended Bible studies. But a lot of times, you may only have one moment with somebody at work. Maybe all hell broke loose in their life 
Maybe a divorce, maybe a sickness, maybe a death, maybe they got fired, or maybe, maybe they're just depressed and you got a window and you got to get in there and you can't plan a 10 week Bible study. You, or you've got a friend that thinks they're already saved, but for a moment, God opens up a door where they, they express, you know, I'm looking for something else. And they're, they're going to, you're never going to keep them in 10 weeks. You may not even have two weeks. You got one shot. Okay. And so, that was kind of what we acted out right there. Okay, so here is the way that I pursue one of those moments. Okay, when I got, I got that, that didn't, how long did we go? 20 minutes? That wasn't even an hour. That was like a 20 minute Bible study. Okay, and half of that was just small talk. Okay, so it, it's not as hard as we make it. Okay, you don't have to have a degree from AST. You can just, I'm, I'm going to show you a trick to remembering. And the first part, I kind of call my baseline. Everybody say the baseline. baseline. Make up your own baseline, okay? What I did, I gave him two scriptures, but you can go find a bunch of them. And my baseline is personal responsibility. I've got to get them off their mama's faith. i got to get them out of grandma's religion. Okay? And so the way I do it is with that scripture, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Okay, did you see how I explained that? And I went to a scripture that said with, with diligent, you know, you got to be diligent about this thing. And, and go through, there's a lot of, and, and there's a narrow path and there's a wide path. In other words, get them thinking, okay, just because, just because it's me and the little church, I'm not the big mega church and I'm not the big group, you know. You gotta, you, you're, what you're doing is you're reforming their, their synapses so it's firing right, okay. You want them thinking about, okay, i got to do this, it's going to be me and God on Judgment Day. Not, I'm not going with Grandma. And I'm not going with the crowd. Okay? i got to work this out myself. And the way you can do that is you can give your story. Everyone, whether you're raised in church or not, you had to get to a point where you and God had to meet, right? So don't be afraid to take them there. With fear, if all you remember is with fear and trembling, work out your own salvation. That's what I did. I remember the night that I, I came. I needed to repent. So... You got, you got, you got to establish that baseline. So, whatever scripture, whatever story, whatever your your background is, you've got to start with a baseline. Everybody say baseline, okay? And if you're taking notes, First Peter two ten, Philippians two twelve, Proverbs sixteen twenty five. Uh, that's that's the one that talks about uh, Proverbs sixteen. That's the one that uh, my mind's blank uh, about. Uh, there's a way that seems right to a man. But at the end, it leads to destruction. In other words, you can think you're right, okay, but it's not right, okay, and it seems right. So just because it seems right doesn't make it. So those are examples. Go go find your own. You'll be more effective if you if you find it because it's yours. So you got to get that common ground. That's not hard. Every one of us can get one or two scriptures, right? Okay. Then this is this is where I call the ingredients. Everybody say the ingredients. The ingredients are, this is where, remember, did I, I think I did it, did I do three, two, one? Okay, everybody say three, three two, two, one. one. How many can remember that? Everybody say three, two, one. Three, two, one. Here is where you don't have to be a bishop, a pastor, an apostle. You can be a baker or a candlestick maker and do this. Okay? Three scriptures I'm going to, they may not believe, they may not, they may disagree with you, but they cannot deny your point of reference and faith. What I call the ingredients. So you started with baseline, now you move to the ingredient section. The ingredient section, did you hear I kept reminding him, now who said this? Jesus. Okay? Everybody say Mark 16, 16. Mark How many can remember Mark 16, 16? You don't, you don't have to be able to quote it. If you've got a Bible or a phone with a Bible program, all you've got to remember is 16, 16. Make up a little jingle. 16, 16, 16, 16, 16. And just mark 16. I'm going to mark 16, 16. Get that in your brain. That's the first place you go. Okay? You've only got to remember three scriptures. Mark 16, 16. Okay? Everybody say Mark 16, 16. Mark 16. And then I want you to remember John 7, 38 through 39. Everybody say John 7, 38, 39. 
So what's the first one? What's the second one? Okay. And then we're going to Luke 24, 47. Where in Luke? I didn't hear you. Who wrote 2447? Luke where? So we got, what's the first one, Mark? I didn't hear you. And then what, where in John? And then what's the last one, Brother Luke? Okay, I, I know you may not be getting it right now. Okay, but that's all you need. Those three, remember we're doing three, two, one, okay? That's three. So all you got to do is re just remember, I got to figure out my baseline, okay? Then I got to remember three scriptures, okay? And Mark 16, 16, John what? And then Luke. Okay, so that's the three. Now, that's the ingredients. Now, what we're going to do is... I call it bake the cake. Okay. So the ingredients are the three. The cake, you only got to remember two chapters. You don't have to memorize them. Anybody know what two chapters I went to? Acts 1 and 2. You don't even have to memorize it. If you just got a Bible, open up chapter 1 and just go verse by... If you got to read the whole thing, that ain't going to hurt. But just kind of go through and highlight in your Bible... And you do this two or three times, you'll remember all this. So the three were Mark, John, Luke. Now what are the two chapters? Okay. And that's where you bake the cake. And you wind up at verse what? Two. And it all comes together. Did you notice? Acts 2.38 is where the cake is baked off of the ingredients that Jesus said. So you take three verses, three references that are the ingredients, then you get to the two chapters of Acts and you bake the cake, and then the icing on the cake is Hebrews 2 and 3. And that's only one verse. 2 and 3 are one verse. See? You're that the 2 and the 3? See that? You're doing these little mental connections. So your three references, two chapters, and one verse. Hebrews 2 and 3. Everybody say Hebrews 2 and 3. And that one's easy to remember because that just kind of stamps on that Jesus is the guy that began this. And you better not neglect it. And it ties in with, if you don't believe, you're going to be damned. And if you're not baptized, you're going to be damned. And Acts chapter 1 and 2, they come going, my Lord, what is all this? And he preaches to them, you're going to be judged because you just crucified him. What do we do? See that? For all those people that tell you it's all about power, they weren't asking, what do we do for power? They were convicted. That's all it takes to be able to preach and prove that you need repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. That is the plan of salvation. So, it's not as hard as you think. All you got to remember is three, two, one. You want to go back through them one more time? Everybody say three, two, one. Three, two, one. Okay, so Mark, 16, John, what's one? Two and three. How many think you could learn that? So, let me tell you how big of a Bible study chart you need if you need a chart. <laughs> you can keep that in your wallet. You can write that down and just ever, everyone just take that out. Mark 16, 16, John 7, 38, 39, Luke 2, 47, 2, Acts 1 and 2, 1, Hebrews 2, 3. You would be amazed how much of a Bible scholar you'd become by just learning 3, 2, 1. They may not come to church. They may not even agree with you. But they cannot defeat your doctrine. 
You don't have to have a Bible school degree. You don't have to have a chart this tall. And you don't have to have 10 weeks. If you got a piece of paper, in fact, let's tear it in half. You don't even need it that big. You could literally write that on the palm of your hand. They never even know you're cheating looking at notes. <laughs> this message is not hard. Maybe that's why he said there's a highway of holiness that is so plain that a fool can walk it. That's what he said. You don't have to be as smart as Bishop and as cool as Boston and as handsome as me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> You're all of that and more. The reason I do this is because I want to equip our young people, our parents. We allow the devil to make us, allow, to cause us to think this is hard. It's not hard. You know more than you really think you know. All you got to do is, I didn't hear you. I love you. I've had fun. And the coffee was great. Everybody say praise the Lord. Everybody say I can do it. Everybody say I'm going to do it. I'm not going to wait. Praise God. Now let me just end with this note. There may be a lot of things that are presented at Oakland Tabernacle that you do not feel that you can do. We may ask somebody to give a million dollars. Praise God. <laughs> but you may have to decline because you don't have it. But this is something that every one of us can do. Everybody say every one of us. I may not can sing like I'd like to sing, but I can do this. Praise the Lord. Everybody can be used of God. I believe that we're on the threshold of revival. Praise God. Hallelujah. All I ask you to do, you're on the threshold. That means the door has already got to be open a little bit. So just shove it on open and walk on through. And let's win the world for the Lord. What do you say? Let's stand right now. Praise the Lord. Let's thank God for the privilege of being a part of his program. In Jesus' name. I love you, Jesus. I praise you, God. I magnify your wonderful name. In Jesus' name. Baptism, then what? Baptism is a burial in water for accountable beings into the remission of sins, for salvation to get into Christ, to become a new creature, to get into the one body. Then, walk in the new life, study and grow, become a servant of righteousness, keep self pure, be an example, have faith in God, follow Jesus, put first things first, Resist temptation, be faithful, and be fruitful.